you know, we are lucky that we have an excess product like um, gas to convert to liquefied natural gas to export. We are very fortunate that we have the resources that we have, whether it's lithium, vanadium, iron ore, gold, uranium, all of these products. That is our unfair advantage. Welcome back to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with me, Jeffrey Cannon. And on today's episode, we're going to dig into the world of liquefied natural gas from the perspective of a resources country that now has an enormous liquefied natural gas export industry, and that's Australia. Uh, years ago, I used uh, was living and working in Australia and made uh, contacts with a huge range of executives in the country, one of whom is Jody Rowe who now heads up an advisory business uh, called Row Advisory, suitably. Jody's a specialist in uh, industrial strategy, growth, and related uh, questions that plague the resources sector. Jody, welcome to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. Thank you, Jeff. It's wonderful to be here. Um, Really looking forward to the podcast. Where are you calling in from today? I think people are very interested. They pick up from the accent, Gerard, you're from Australia, but whereabouts are you today? Uh, today I'm at a place um, called Maiponga Beach, which is about an hour, 20 minutes south of Adelaide. Uh, it's a little beach. It's a tiny little cove and it's, yeah. it's only got about 30 houses and it's hard to believe that it's only an hour and a bit from Adelaide. It's just brilliant so yes so that's that's where i am today the sun is shining the water is as still as and the dogs are waiting to go down to the beach (laughs) well we will get this uh, recorded quickly so that you can get on with what i think promises to be another spectacular uh, australian summer day based on the sunshine i know is streaming in the window Uh, First, though, for people who are not familiar with the liquefied natural gas industry in Australia, I wonder if you could just take a moment and and describe that in general terms and uh, questions that just to kind of help frame the the industry, its size, its scale, the number of businesses operating it, how old this industry has been running, that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, So I would say the the, um, industry in Australia has been going for I'd say 15, well, no, probably about 20 years because you've got Woodside involved on the northwest shelf. So there's around 10 LNG plants in Australia and basically it's taking gas in its raw form and liquefying it for the export market. So it produces, um, I think at the moment, it's probably as far as exporters goes, Australia's ranked number three in the world. I think the US is number one, Qatar's number two. So there is about 80 million tonnes a year out of the 400 million tonnes that are produced globally uh, are actually produced in Australia. So predominantly on the northwest shelf of Western Australia, people would know of Woodside, Chevron, yeah. um, global player Chevron, as well as um, Santos. Then you've got Darwin LNG, which is Santos and Impex. Um, And then on the eastern seaboard, you've got uh, Santos, Shell and Origin with their joint venture partners such as Conoco, Phillips, et cetera. So from that perspective, especially in Queensland, the CSG, coal seam gas to LNG business, basically started... I'd say in 2008, 2007, Centos was probably the first one in there, Queensland Gas, by buying fields, et cetera. And then, of course, the bigger players came in, showed a lot of interest. BG turned into Shell, uh, Santos with their joint venture partners and APLNG Origin. And, of course, then you've got Arrow and PetroChina as well. So from something that started off very small in the last sort of 15 years, it's, it's boomed. Um, for a lot of lot of reasons, but in the West, it's been there for quite quite a long time. Quite a long time, yeah. Woodside's plant, I think, goes way back, even beyond twenty years. May even be as uh, as many as thirty years ago uh, was kicked off. So it's a long, yeah. long, long standing industry. Any sense as to how, on a relative basis, how big this industry is to Australia? I mean, how meaningful is it to a country that already is a 
global leader in coal, global leader in uh, iron ore. Where, where does where does oil and gas uh, stand now? Uh, it it's so important to Australia. It, you know, we can't underplay that in the sort of the push for climate change and net zero and things like that. We've got to sit back and realise economically. Uh, the gas industry, I prefer to call it the gas industry, um, it employs about 18,000 people. But if you look through the supply chain from an employment perspective, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people and businesses that rely on the gas industry. Um, so jobs and income, uh, absolute priority. Uh, I think also these players provide a lot of energy security. So what they don't export, they've got agreements for domestic gas. And Australia, probably more so on the East Coast, has significant constraints over that Eastern gas. Um, you know, they've got long-term contracts, et cetera, that they need to fulfil, but there's also this push on domestic gas. So that energy security is really important. Um, I also think, like, the regional benefits, we, you know, yeah. Jeff, you know as well as I do, when you look at that Surat Basin and even potentially for Narrabri, if Santos ever get that project off the ground, I think I'll be dead and buried when that happens. Um, you know, you look at the local content, yeah. uh, you know, what these businesses, the sort of emergence of Toowoomba as this regional hub, not just from gas but from coal and agriculture, you can't underestimate the actual benefits regionally that that has done employment, business, et cetera. And I, I really do think that we uh, are very fortunate to have had th these industries come into Queensland and, and Western Australia and, and Northern Territory and actually provide employment where, you know, take that away. It's a significant impact on the economy, significant. You know, it's uh, dramatic. I remember when I was uh, working there, there was talk at the time of uh, putting a, a big runway, an airport airstrip in Toowoomba. And within the space of four yeah. years, it was built. And uh, I remember being yeah. there and watching the first, literally the first aircraft come in. It was, uh, it was uh, amazing to see the, the, the uh, development. So wealth wealth plows into those parts of the country that are involved in energy exports to a degree that is hard to really uh, appreciate. Um, I wonder if you could mm. help me understand, though, Australia is a high-cost economy. <laughs> it has some of the highest housing prices in the world, relatively speaking. And the country is fairly isolated and, and to a degree, uh, self-contained, although very dependent on exports. Uh, but it's a high-cost economy. How does it compete when you're dealing with the Qataris who can produce gas at ridiculously low prices and the Americans? Where's the, where's the inherent advantage here uh, that Australia has in, in gas? Uh, it's, it's a great question because absolutely we are definitely one of the highest cost places um, in the world. Mm. I think I think you've got a couple of points here that the actual ability to do business effectively with Australian companies can be a hell of a lot easier than other countries. Um, and I think the other factor is that we have volume and that's attractive. When you're looking at other markets where, say, uh, China is 60% coal. Um, we can provide a lot of solutions for them in close proximity. So if we think of somewhere like, you know, China that's now taken over US imports yeah. as well as, say, Japan second, they're very close to us. And in some respects, they're in our, they're in our joint ventures. So they've done their best to actually secure supply by having us in those joint venture partners. Um, I think the ease of which you can do business with an Australian company is probably a lot more effective than it could be with other other countries. Um, that's kind of how I would see our competitive advantage being strong. Is, it, is that? Yeah, low, low friction, <laughs> uh, rule of law, uh, a speed by which things get done. 
um, Australia has certain yeah. certain advantages, plus that geologic advantage. You're physically closer to those markets, and uh, that advantage yeah. is not going away. If you have to sail liquefied gas through uh, Panama now, which of course is struggling under drought, uh, so uh, ships are getting kettled on the uh, on both sides of the canal, just struggling to get through. Uh, Australia's volume starts to look exceptionally appealing because it's not not uh, caught up in some of those constraints. Um, how does Australia see uh, the liquefied natural gas trade long term? I mean, there's lots of conversation out there about the possibility or the view that gas uh, will uh, the demand will flatten in in as as soon as 2030. Uh, but at the same time, there are other forecasts that that suggest it'll run for a very very long time. Is how did, what is the Australian point of view on this? How does it characterize locally? You know, there's if you look at the media, there's a whole range of mixed views. If you look at someone like Shell, they'll say that it's going to increase by 50% by 2040. Yeah. But if you actually look at the logic of um, what's happening out there in the world, especially when you look at uh, the countries that are still heavily reliant on coal, you know, um, 60% China, South Africa, 70%. I mean, the whole African continent has, you know, slow progress to going to renewables and gas. So if you look at that market, that's really a lot of it can be classified as untapped. Mm. The only thing that prohibits the demand um, is really production, actually being able to produce enough gas. So my kind of thinking is that, you know, 80% of existing gas is under long-term contracts. With these other countries transitioning over to a cleaner energy, and that's what gas is, um, the demand should be steady if not growing, I would have thought, and that's probably more consistent with Shell. You listen to others and they'll say that the price will drive down that demand, but the way that copies and climate change and people and protesters pushing for net zero and, and emissions with somewhat unrealistic targets, yeah. I would say that gas's demand would go continue to, to increase. So whether we can produce enough gas to fulfil that demand is questionable, but, I mean, that's yeah. that's how I would see it. Yeah. So a supply-driven problem, not a demand-driven problem, uh, and and so mm. the supply, as long as the supply is there, the demand will be there because it is such a nice substitute for coal. I think that's a great point. As countries experience cleaner energy, natural gas over coal, they prefer cleaner energy. <laughs> they'll, they'll take the coal out because it's it's an air pollutant and creates health problems and the like. Uh, so it, once you start yeah. to experience it, you know, the, the demand is there and there's a lot of coal consumed. Now, of course, the uh, uh, Australia isn't the only supplier to the Asian uh, basin. How is the uh, war in Ukraine and the sanctions that have been applied to Russia, how is that played out now in, in Asian markets uh, as it might affect Australia demand? Uh, is it is it uh, impacted the demand in a positive way? Is it spurring new developments? How's how's it playing out? Part of me actually thinks because there's long term contracts that the Ukraine war has absolutely done nothing for Australia except create an opportunity for short term gas agreements, right? So when because the argument here has been uh, the U this is this has been pushed by politics continuously that Ukraine war has actually increased the domestic gas price but i don't i don't i simply don't think that's the case mm -hmm. right it it has like, impacted the domestic price in countries that were competing for those same cargoes the spot cargoes or the available cargoes pakistan bangladesh india uh, oh, they, they left the market shortly after the sanctions were imposed because the the gas all went to Germany. This is spare cargoes from from uh, the United States and Qatar. But if if Australia's gas is all on long contracts, that's a fair point. Like, wouldn't really affect price or volume. Well, the, I think that's the thing because you know when domestic gas, you know the governments push the operators to actually 
provide more domestic gas. They've released more acreage on the proviso that they provide domestic gas. Ah, yeah. um, and companies like Shell have committed to extra domestic gas. Uh, domestic gas. Um, you know, there's only a small opportunity for them to sell to the European market. And if you are there to make money, well, then, yes, it's an opportunity. You're not going to knock course, back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but the whole Ukraine war and the way that um, Fukushima has impacted the energy sector in the EU, you know, with Germany going back to coal and... Um, switching off their nuclear plants and stuff, that is more concerning, I would have thought, if I was a net zero climate change protester. I'd be yeah. more concerned about that than Australia selling a bit of opportunistic gas to the EU because of the war. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair challenge, actually. On balance, it's it may, in fact, be a, a minor issue. In, in the Canadian context, we did have Germany's chancellor uh, pay a visit requesting that Canada unlock liquefied natural gas exports to Europe. Uh, and the Canadian federal government's position was there was no business case to do that. Uh, that there, there might be a case oh, to wow. do, yeah, there might be a case to do hydrogen exports to Europe, but not gas. And, uh, the, the, and, and then you fast forward 18 months and the Biden administration hits pause on liquefied natural gas export project approvals under the logic that the cumulative effects of more gas um, exports and projects is harder on the environment, and um, uh, and so uh, these are these aren't disconnected events from my way of thinking. I think I think yeah. they are related. How is this pause in the United States playing out in Australia? Are the Australians viewing this as a window to expand, or are they just ignoring it as a because it's in a it's in an election year and therefore subject to political change? Um, I haven't spoken to the operators, but my personal view is what an opportunity. Thank you very much. I, I actually look at this and I think you've paused how many LNG export terminals you've paused, which is just simply export dollars. How many new projects have you paused? But the reality is that will you exporting um, LNG reduce the emissions? No. Right, the com the countries that are actually producing, you know, electricity via coal, you know, they they are not they're going to lose that opportunity for what is the biggest exporter of LNG now. Yeah, that, I, I just look at that and I think, why why would you do that? I mean, just for political gain, if nothing else, surely people can see straight through what Biden's doing. Yeah, I just think that. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever from an export dollars perspective, from a jobs perspective, from a climate change perspective. But, you know, if Australia's not sitting there looking at this and saying, okay, what are those markets that they were going to sell the gas to? Yeah. Hello, like let's produce some more and sell some more, create more economic benefits for Australia and just get after it. You know, it, it's a very socialist thing to do. Would that be correct? It's it's a it makes it's a, a compelling window. These windows don't open very often, and when one of the largest players says we're we're stepping back, uh, it does create uh, the the play for for th others to get in. Shortly thereafter, Qatar announced that they were going to aggressively expand their um, one of their northern fields uh, to to get into the market. There you go. And uh, so, yeah, so it plays. If if it wasn't Australia, it would be. It, it is going to be the Qataris. Um, I know from a Canadian context, there weren't any projects advanced sufficiently that they could uh, proceed quickly to final investment decision and therefore step in front of the American queue. Uh, so the, I don't know that the window creates much opportunity for new projects here. What it might do is create an uh, opportunity for uh, s uh, existing um, uh, supply chain participants who say, may have been counting on those U.S. projects, may create a play for them to go work elsewhere in some other industry. Uh, yeah. so, so there's an angle there. But, but uh, from, a, from a policy standpoint, it doesn't appear to have much of an impact on the, on the sort of the Canadian context. Um, 
If you if you look back at the look at the Australian context, though, what are the kinds of challenges that face Australia in in the in the sense of its LNG trade? Is it supply chain constraint? Is it talent? What 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 stands in the way of Australia's um, future success here? Well, I mean, there's there's always supply chain issues. There's no doubts about that. And post COVID, I think every industry has suffered that as well. Um, definitely, LNG pricing would be a significant challenge. It is a market economy, so trying to get that under control. Mm. Um, so probably the uh, challenge around regional trade is is an issue in competition. You know, you know, it, it was only a couple of years ago that Qatar was first, Australia was second, now the yeah. US has gone to number one. Mm. You know, we're not Robinson Crusoe, we're not the only one on the in the world that's actually producing LNG. So we do have a competitive advantage in so many things, but like you say, costs costs are significant. Um, new plants, as far as I'm aware, there are no new plants on the horizon, but getting investment dollars into new capital projects, um, you've really nowadays, well, nowadays, any day, you've got to make sure that that capital is working for you hard because the opportunity to get investment dollars in to these sorts of industries will be a challenge versus going carbon capture or some something like that that Macquarie would invest in. Um, I, th- I do think one of the biggest issues, and, you know, I've spoken to Adani about this as well, is that in some respects the protesters, outside of the tangible challenges of getting a project up and marketing a product that, yeah. you know, is less emissions but people still think, quite negatively because what the media put out is is really that whole process of education. Um, you know, the protesters in the schools, getting getting people to understand that, you know, what the benefits of, of having uh, LNG as a transition fuel in, to get to, you know, net zero or to impact to have a really good impact on climate change, it it just seems to be when you listen to what the media and what's out there at the moment, there's this real naivety about switching off coal and gas and everything's going to come up rosy. Well, you know, we saw in Victoria the other day when the power poles went, there was a big storm that went through, 500,000 people did not have power. Now, Naturally, my cynic cynicism went to, well, how many had solar panels? Oh, guess what? There was no sun. So, you know, that these sorts of risks are huge. Uh, New South Wales, um, 93, on one particular day, 93% was coal. There was no solar, uh, no, no sun wind. and no wind. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a really big education that people need to understand that the strategy needs to be balanced and they also need to understand is does nuclear play a part in that? And if it does, let's start talking about what is realistic rather than, you know, letting these um, could be a radio personality getting on t- telling us that they need to switch off coal and gas immediately. Well, who wants to live in a blackout situation? So yeah. I think I think the industry has a lot to um to do about sort of getting facts out there rather than the media, which is either left or right. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, presenting it's a, a narrative uh, I, which I actually is not science or engineering based and doesn't it doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Uh, I think that's a, actually a really a, a important point to underscore, which is uh, Australia's a uh, very, very uh, advanced in its adoption of solar panels is just one example, especially in the South Adelaide area. Uh, the penetration rate is very high, uh, probably 40 or 50 percent of the homes, maybe something at that level, have uh, solar panels. And uh, so yeah. they're highly reliant on steady sunshine now. And uh, and then when yeah. it's not there, where where do you get your energy? It's a great, great problem. I think that's it. I mean, we're, you know, we we have so many 
um, advantages in, you know, South Australia as an example, 70% renewable, but everyone thinks, oh, okay, we'll just, we'll just make green hydrogen. Well, I haven't heard anyone say yet that it's economic for domestic gas or for export purposes. So this impatience into trying to be, you know, net zero in a short period of time. Yeah. My question is to sort of for domestic gas purposes, what is the price that Australia is prepared to pay for electricity? Because at the moment, if you're buying electricity, you're paying an absolute premium. And for the land mass that we have, the amount of people that we have, for the lack of infrastructure that we have domestically, um, you will be paying a premium for a long time until we get that certainty that renewables can supply it. But, you know, you still got to store it. And th and that all comes at a significant cost. So yeah. to my, my point, like, you know, we are lucky that we have an excess product like um, gas to convert to liquefied natural gas to export. We are very fortunate that we have the resources that we have, whether it's lithium, vanadium, iron ore, gold, uranium, all of these products. Oh, that like, is like our unfair advantage. Yeah. And we need to use them for our advantage and not just blindly say we're going to switch these things off and cross our fingers and hope that the power goes on because <laughs> that, that would be dumb. That would be really stupid. So I actually think it's more not so much about the, you know, getting finance, getting projects up, all has its challenges, getting resources and people. Yeah. We have only got 14 million people out of 25 million people that work. 30% of them are on minimum wage. So, you know, we only have a small workforce. We have to bring more people in. But the challenge is where's that education? Where is that? You know, who who are the pub, general public going to trust to get the information from to understand that we need balance? Yeah. Um, and no one wants to touch nuclear. I don't know. Where, where's Canada on nuclear energy? Well, Canada uh, has a nuclear agency which has uh, many, many years ago d d developed a, uh, a reactor model called Candu Reactor, which is sold around the world. The uh, nuclear, the, uh, many of the provinces have nuclear reactors. Uh, New Brunswick has one. Uh, Ontario has a fleet. Uh, they're aging, and uh, they are expensive to build, and they're very expensive to repair when they go down. And there's a requirement when yep. they are, because they 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 provide such enormous baseload power. Uh, there is a requirement to. Uh, have some sort of alternative or secondary power generation capacity uh, that that can step in when when those baseload power disappears. Uh, uh, the country though has not built a new nuclear reactor in decades, and there is a general yeah. sentiment I think amongst the population that nuclear power uh, still struggles to deal with its uh, its its waste and waste cleanup and the risks waste. that you see with. Um, uh, Chernobyl and uh, Fukushima uh, are are sufficient to to cause uh, the the policymakers to pause around uh, sanctioning nuclear projects. Um, there there there's still though lots of interest in small and modular nuclear facilities, and there's a movement to look at these things rather than these gigantic facilities that take forever to build, hard to permit. And then costly yeah. to maintain. Maybe do some things at a much smaller scale, but um, but I would say North America is st is similar to Australia in really struggling to reconcile the perceptions of nuclear with the reality of nuclear, and uh, and so we're not not any further ahead, frankly. So we have a ways to go. Yeah, it's, I mean it's an it's an interesting thing. I watched Oliver Stone's Nuclear Now on. Um, on, I think it was Paramount Documentaries. Yeah. And it it was just a really interesting, I mean, he, he just did it because he was interested in knowing what was going on. And yeah. uh, I thought small nuclear reactors was way more advanced than what it is, um, but it, it doesn't seem like it is yet. And, you know, they... I, I do think it's a place in Australia that we we should be talking about and we do have the landmass to deal with the waste, but 
no political party wants to <laughs> wants to deal with it and you know i don't know how how we are going to reach the goals unrealistic goals that they do set and i don't think i think people you know i was sorry i was at a meeting i caught up with someone from santos on monday and from 11 till 12, apparently on every Monday, they have protesters out the front. And, I, I, you know, climate change and yeah. all of this sort of stuff. Every every Monday, same time. And I, I'm looking at these people thinking, you know, if you think as an individual you are not responsible for, you know, emissions, whether it's from the products that are on your back, the rubber shoes that you're wearing, yeah. Um, how you got to the protest. We're, we're all guilty of emissions and, yeah. um, you know, what are you doing personally to reduce that outside of putting things in a yellow bin called renewables, you know? So yeah. <clears throat> I think there's a, is a, I'm not, not going to push it onto oil and gas companies, but most companies that I talk to now, they don't talk about, they talk about how they can reduce waste around pallets. They, that their goals are to net zero. Their their goals is about getting their their business to net zero. What are you doing personally to get to net zero? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know what people are doing. I just find it quite hypocritical. So this to me, there's a big issue in the actual education process. Yeah. I think that's um, a, a global phenomenon, not just uh, an Australian phenomenon or certainly a Canadian phenomenon uh, that, that the, the narrative about um, energy, man energy security, uh, energy poverty, energy supply, the cost of energy delivery, energy resilience, all of these are not set correctly um, and, and the narratives are not uh, robust from a science and, and uh, physics and engineering capacity. It's it's driven by emotional uh, notions that uh, really are are blocking us from making meaningful progress forward. So I share that view. I appreciate the uh, yeah. conversation around LNG. Uh, Australia is way uh, well advanced. Uh, Canada will be lucky to get uh, 20 million tons on the water in the next uh, five years. Uh, uh, Australia is uh, 80 million tons and, and uh, moving quickly. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Jody, thanks yeah. so much for coming on the podcast today. You're welcome. Thanks, Jeff.